Hi everyone and welcome back. Our next speaker has a degree in engineering physics, whatever that means. Um, it's vague enough that he's been able to work in fields as disparate as networking, computer vision, and even in financial engineering. He's also one of the most helpful and informed people on Hackaday.io, and I've read his comments on many people's projects where he's helped them out of a jam, and that's frankly awesome. He's also made a number of projects, some of which I've even rebuilt. One squeezes every last lumen out of an LED running on a coin cell and will run from something like two to five to 10 years, depending on your estimates. Fantastic work of over-engineering and also tremendously accessible to uh, normal people. Um, today he's going to talk about fixing up a not quite perfectly working uh, network analyzer. Um, please welcome to the Hackaday Supercon stage, Ted Yapo. Thanks, Elliot, and, and, and thank you, everybody. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is, um, is thank Mike and the editorial staff at the new Hackaday Journal, because this is the first paper that's been published in the journal, and uh, they were tremendously helpful in organ obviously starting the journal in the first place, having the idea and, and making it happen, but in um, helping get my paper through. The other group of people that I really need to extend a, a big thanks to are the anonymous reviewers. You know who you are. I don't know who you are, but I know how much I know how much effort you put into reviewing the paper, and your comments were very thoughtful and constructive, and I think they, they made it much better. So by way of introduction, my name is Ted Yappo, and uh, I test a lot of RF circuits, and it's not because I like it, it's because I like to design and build RF circuits. And one thing you realize when you get into RF is that there's a whole lot of cut and try engineering, uh, as they call it, because inductors at some frequencies start to look like capacitors, and capacitors at some frequencies start to look like inductors because of parasitics. Uh, your circuit board becomes a component or multiple components that perhaps you didn't intend. Uh, and so in preparing this talk, I just dumped out a bin that was labeled test jigs on the uh, top of my work workbench and, and took a picture. So this is some of the ways I've tried to measure things over, over the years. Each one of these was built actually to test something else. So that's kind of the scale of it. This is what you want if you're gonna test, um, test network devices. I looked this up on eBay this morning over breakfast. I found one used in good condition for $64,500. Although it's not exactly true, they want an extra 300 for shipping, which I think is ridiculous at that point. Um, I don't have one of these. Uh, of course, this goes to 40 gigahertz, which is a little bit out of my uh, design range. But the idea with a vector network analyzer is you can measure uh, RF energy that's transmitted through or reflected from an RF component or assembly of components, generally referred to a, as a network. And you can measure both the amplitude and phase of that energy, and that'll be very important later on in the talk. So I didn't buy one of these. Uh, instead, I bought this particular unit. This is a Regal DSA 815, uh, one of their sp spectrum analyzers. Uh, this was announced, I think, in 2011, um, and the first day I saw it for sale, I bought it. I started typing in credit card numbers, my own credit card numbers, not somebody else's. Uh, and I bought it because it, was a, it represented a tremendous value at the time relative to kind of the next, you know, the, the, the um, professional grade instruments as, as they would have been thought of at the time. Now this has a much better reputation. Um, I bought one of the earliest units that they made. So this is like Rev 0000 of the hardware. And, um, and it has a few issues that I'll get into. Uh, but I just want to say that some of the things I'll talk about today won't affect an analyzer that you bought tomorrow. If you bought the same thing tomorrow or even last year, you wouldn't see some of the problems that I'll be talking about today. Um, I don't, in this talk, I won't be talking about using it as a spectrum analyzer, but as a scalar network analyzer, which is related to the vector anal network analyzer we, before, we saw before, but can only measure the amplitude of the signal, not the phase. So to measure a, a device, here I have a, a 50 megahertz low-pass filter down here that I constructed, and um, I added a couple attenuator pads to reduce reflection. To measure a circuit, you attach it to the, the two ports on the analyzer, and what you have is you have a tracking generator port and a spectrum analyzer port, and the tracking generator port generates an RF signal that goes through your device and is measured by the spectrum analyzer. Why it's called a tracking generator is because the center frequency of the 
uh, RF signal is in sync with the spectrum analyzer. So when the spectrum analyzer is analyzing a band around 100 megahertz or so, the tracking generator is generating a signal at 100 megahertz. And when the spectrum analyzer looks over at 101, the tracking generator moves over. So you can generate curves um, of, of the amplitude response of your devices. So here's actually that same 6 meter, 50 megahertz low pass filter. Uh, the black line is a simulation. It's supposed to have a very deep notch over here at 157 megahertz. That's to kill a third harmonic of the 53.2 megahertz signal. But the black line's a simulation. That's what I expected. So these other colored curves are what you measure with the analyzer. And depending on how you set the attenuation on the analyzer, depending on how you set the tracking generator level, uh, you get different curves, which is a little confusing. I didn't expect it ex to exactly match the simulation because maybe I picked the wrong components. They have bad um, parasitics. Maybe my circuit board design technique isn't very good, which wouldn't, wouldn't surprise many people. Um, but there was something more to it. I, I should say that sometimes you do see this sort of thing uh, in network measurements because of reflections in, in the measurement path. So often adding more attenuation will kind of bring your measurements in line with what you expect because you, you damp reflections and reflections don't make it into the detector and so they don't distort your measurement. But in fact, what was happening was something different. Uh, this is what's supposed to happen. There's just supposed to be one path out through the device under test. And in fact, there's a, a secondary path between the output and the input. There's an internal leakage path inside the device. And it turns out in almost every device there's a leakage path. And that $64,000 used spectrum, uh, uh, VNA rather, there's a leakage path as well. And in a VNA, there's a very convenient way to compensate for that leakage path. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. With this uh, device, because it only measures amplitude and not phase, this is very difficult to correct for. And that's really the basis of what this paper is about, finding a way to correct for it. So you can get an idea of how much leakage is, is in coming through that path if you just turn the spectrum analyzer on. Here I've turned it on and I've just screwed in 50 ohm terminators on both ports, so there's no, no external path, supposedly. Um, with the tracking generator off, you just see what's called the noise floor. So this yellow line down at the bottom just represents the noise that's generated by the input stage of the analyzer itself and the 50 ohm resistor. Here it's measuring about 90, minus 90 dBm. Uh, that's fine for spectrum analyzer. The level that you measure depends on the bandwidth that you look at because this is a noise signal. But this is fine. Spectrum analyzers aren't really optimized for very low noise figure. It's, it's just not what they're, they're good at. Um, if you turn the tracking generator on, the noise level jumps up. In this case, I measured it's about minus 68 dBm. Uh, that's 20 dB higher than the noise floor or about 100 times stronger signal, 100 times more power. Um, to put this in, in another perspective, uh, if you've ever used a, a, a ham radio or a, a shortwave radio that has an S meter that measures the signal strength, S9 is a strong signal. This is S9 plus 6 dB approximately. So this is about four times stronger than a strong received signal on, a, on an HF radio. Uh, this is a lot of leakage. And like I said, if you buy one of these today, you won't see this. The leakage will, may not be down at the noise floor, but it'll be much lower. So I wanted to test this and, and um, you know, what I'd been testing previously were the things that I had developed and of course, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I designed them wrong. It's, it's, there are too many unknowns. The analyzer's unknown and what I've designed is unknown. So I went back to eBay. Uh, I bought this HP uh, step attenuator. Um, it's, it's a relic. I don't have a date on this. I know they um, use a capital D in DB, which was a long time ago. At least they call them megahertz instead of megacycles per second. But uh, this still works great. It's uh, 0 to 120 dB by 10 dB. It's, uh, the specs say it's plus or minus 1.5 dB down to, to where I'm looking at. So I decided to test this with the analyzer and see what I get. So here's a little cartoon of what you'd expect. As you, um, if you set the attenuator to 40 dB, you should see that the straight line, 40 dB attenuation, no matter what frequency you look at. And as you step the attenuator down by 10 dB, uh, that's in fact what you get. You get a series of straight lines, um, and that's, that's what you'd expect. So this is the model, uh, and if you actually try it with the actual attenuator at 40 dB, you get a decent line. It's within the 1.5 dB specified for the uh, attenuator. And then you try the other attenuations, and it quickly goes off the rails. So at 50 dB, you get a little wiggle that shouldn't be there. 60, clearly something's going on. 
70 is just, it's garbage. Uh, and then lower attenuations beyond that just kind of hug in around the, the 70, minus 70 dB uh, line. And it's not coincidence that this is right around the tracking generator leakage level. So there's something going on there that's, that's causing this. You often see something like this when you have reflections that, I, that like I mentioned before, reflection, reflections in the measurement path. Um, and the cure for that is usually to add attenuation because you've had an attenuation in, in attenuator in the path and it absorbs the reflections so they don't get measured by the detector. This is an attenuator, right? So it, by turning that knob, you're actually adding attenuation. This should make, if there are reflections in the measurement path, this should make it better. And in fact, it's, it's worse. So I tried to work up a model for what's going on. Um, and the first thing to realize is that even though it's a scalar network analyzer, you're only measuring amplitude, the, the signal it's, itself does have an amplitude and phase. You can think about it as an amplitude and a phase angle, or in this case, I've, written, I've displayed it as an in-phase component and a quadrature component. These are just sine and cosine, two reference, com, uh, reference signals that are 90 degrees out of phase. So that's the signal you want to measure. And the leakage itself is also a vector and they add vector-wise, so you add vectors head to tail, and what you end up measuring is this green arrow. That's the vector sum. If you bought the expensive vector network analyzer, you could measure the phase and amplitude of each of these vectors, subtract vector-wise, and get the original signal. Unfortunately, with a scalar network analyzer, the only thing you can measure is the length of the green arrow, and if the phase between the leakage and the external measurement path changes, well, the measurement changes. So if we look at this in a little more depth, I have the same diagram here on the left. On the right, I have a graph of the measured amplitude versus the frequency. This is just the length of the green arrow, but instead on a, on a um, logarithmic scale, on a decibel scale. So if we sweep over frequency, what's happening is as the frequency is increasing, the phase shift is increasing, and so the length of the green arrow moves, uh, and you trace out exactly those same peaks and cusps that we saw in the um, measurement of the attenuator. You note that while this was happening, the actual, the true signal, the blue vector wasn't moving at all. So the external signal was exactly the same, it's just that the phase shift has changed and that's ca caused the waviness in, in the measurements. So you can put some error bounds on this. You can draw this, this picture. Uh, it, it, it's a little complex, but basically you have the tracking generator leakage level here at about minus, I think it was, I think it was minus 73 dBm. Yeah, if you, plot the input signal level here, um, you can make an upper bound and a lower bound. Your measurement's guaranteed by this model to be within this green envelope. Uh, as an example, if the leakage and the signal are exactly the same here at this point, you can measure plus 6 dB higher or minus, you know, infinite dB. And in reality, you'll measure the noise floor. Um, if you're at all familiar with RF measurements, you might think, well, the leakage and the input signal are the same power here. So if you had Two, twice the power would be plus 3 dB. Uh, what, in fact, is happening is you're adding voltages. So if you add two signals of the same voltage, you have twice the voltage, or four times the power, and you measure 6 dB higher. Uh, this is all great, but I want to fix it. So what do you do? Well, um, this is a hardware hacking conference, ostensibly, and I'm sure there are people out there who say, well, just open it up and fix it. And tack solder some tin shields around and make it happen. Uh, at the time, this was the most expensive piece of equipment I owned. I really couldn't justify buying the first one. I certainly couldn't buy justifying a replacement. Uh, I didn't want to avoid the warranty. Uh, wasn't sure that I could, um, <laughs> yeah, I was chicken, didn't do it. But poultry jokes aside, uh, I learned a lot by finding an alternate solution. And this other solution can be applied not only to this analyzer, but any scalar network analyzer that has leakage issues, not only internally, but externally. Let's say you're measuring a board and there's a leakage path on the board, it's possible to apply this kind of method when, when you can't modify the other leakage path. So I, I'm glad I took this approach. I still can open it up and, and try to fix it the other way if I wanted. So here's a, here's a simplified solution. The details of this are in the paper. Uh, there's more to it than this, but this is, this is the basic. This is the same diagram we saw before where you have the blue true signal, the leakage um, in red, and you have a result that's the, the vector sum of the two. I've just put labels on them, just put variables on their length. Um, and the problem is, what you really have, you have one 
measurement, the length of the green arrow, and you have two unknowns. You have the length of the blue arrow, which is what you want, and you have the phase angle between the blue arrow and, and the leakage. Uh, and you have a single measurement and two unknowns, of course, there's no unique solution. There are a whole bunch of true signal levels that could give you that green arrow measurement depending on the phase. So I thought, well, what can I do? Well, I, I can try to make another measurement. So I thought, what if I invert the phase? I know how to invert a phase. You flip a signal upside down and measure that again. Well, now I've got two measurements and two unknowns. They're the same two unknowns, um, the, the length of the true signal and the relative phase. You might think there are two phases here, but they're complementary angles, um, uh, uh, supplementary angles rather. Uh, they add to 180 degrees, or pi radians. I know the crowd can be a little touchy about units. Uh, so with this two measurements and two unknowns, it turns out there's a solution using the law of cosines. Uh, they say when you put up an equation like this, you lose half your audience, but it looks to me like everybody's still here. Um, uh, so you make these two measurements, uh, you do a couple uh, square roots, and you get an answer. There's more to it than this. You can read it in the paper, and I'll talk a little bit about it later on. But this gives you the intuition of, of how it works and how, how simple it really is. So now I need a, a phase inverter. And um, they sell them. I went back to eBay and bought one. They're called mixers. Uh, and if you drive a, a diode mixer hard enough, it um, uh, with DC, uh, with a DC bias, it makes a very good phase inverter. Dr drive the diodes one way, you get one phase out. Drive the diodes the opposite direction, you get 180 degrees out, which is exactly what a mixer does, except in, it does it at maybe 100, 200 megahertz, uh, whatever your local oscillator frequency is. Uh, and the nice thing about commercial mixers is they're optimized for symmetry. So the amplitude uh, between the two paths is, is very similar, and they're optimized for exactly 180 degree phase shift between the two. Um, because if you don't have that, you end up with unwanted mixing products, right? You end up with a very bad mixer. So here's how you actually use it. The, the dotted box at the top is actually the mixer, canned here. Uh, and I've just added a DC bias network at the bottom. I've got a couple of AA batteries and a slide switch to switch the polarity. The resistor network is first to limit the current through the diodes. It turns out this mixer will be 21 years old next January, so I didn't want to kill it. Uh, it's made it this long, so I have to limit the current through the diode so I don't burn them out. And I also want to present a 50 ohm impedance to that port. Mixers are very sensitive to termination on, on their ports. So with the um, bias going one way, two diodes are, are turned on. The input and output are exactly in phase. If you switch, reverse the bias, the other two diodes are on, and the path through the transformers causes the output to be 180 degrees out of phase. So this is a very simple circuit. The problem with this is you have to take one measurement, flip the switch, take another measurement. So I made a USB version, um, uses a, an SMD mixer at this point, uh, USB to UART bridge, and um, I, I just threw away the serial signals themselves. I just used the control lines DTR and RTS to bias the diodes. So this works great. You hook it up to a computer. You can completely automate the measurement. So how does it work? Well, you remember this train wreck. This is. Um, what the measurements look like with just the raw analyzer. Uh, and here are the results. So from 40 down to about 70 dB, uh, which is coincidentally where the, the tracking generator leakage was, it looks pretty good. There's still some waves in here um, at the end. The attenuators spec to plus or minus one and a half dB. These are about two dB. Um, but, of course, there's uh, specs in the, for the analyzer as well. So I think this is a good result. The attenuators, attenuations, rather, that were below the, the leakage level, um, 90 dB doesn't, you don't get a result at all. In fact, what you end up with is an, an, an imaginary result, which, because this is a scalar measurement, there's no physical interpretation for that. You can just know that you don't get a result. Throw that away. Um, and the 80 dB, because of noise, you do get some noise down here. And the convention I've just adopted is if you measure something that's below the leakage level, you just throw it away because it's, this is just noise and this is garbage. Um, there are little blips down here, you'll notice, down near DC. Uh, and this is because the transformers and the mixer don't work down to DC, right? So uh, RF, nobody cares about those frequencies anyway. So that was kind of the overview of the, of the simple um, version. It turns out there's more to it, and all this is in the paper. 
that you can look at. Uh, there's a more comprehensive model for the signals. Um, and in getting the results that I just showed, you have to take into account fixture loss. So that's the phase and amplitude effects of all the cabling connectors within your measurement path. You have to look at amplitude errors. So the mixer isn't perfect. It's an imperfect phase switch. There may be a difference in amplitude between one phase and the other. Uh, there may be phase errors. It may not be 180 degrees. I don't have uh, an analytical, analytical solution for this yet. It's, it's work to be done still, but uh, I've got some ideas on how you bound the error. Uh, it turns out just practically the phase errors in commercial mixers are, are pretty low. The, the two phases are, are almost exactly 180 degrees difference. There's an issue of noise de-embedding. You remember that noise floor that we saw, that, that yellow trace? Um, if you measure a signal near the noise floor, the noise floor actually adds into your signal. And so in order to use this algorithm, you need to call so-called de-embed that noise to remove the effect of that noise from your signal. Um, we talked about leakage level calibration. That was a purple line. You can almost just read it right off um, the, um, the analyzer. And, and lastly, there are impedance mis mismatch errors. Um, and this happens because in, in with this technique because diode mixers don't present a good 50 ohm output. So if you look at the impedance of um, uh, either the input or the output of the diode mixer, they're not exactly 50 ohms. And in many cases, they're not anywhere near 50 ohms. So you may need to add attenuators in the measurement path to damp reflections so that those don't get measured and, and um, corrupt, your, corrupt your measurement. So here's the entire paper. Can you read that in back? Going back? <laughs> Probably not. It's online. Journal.hackaday.io. You'll find it. It's 19 pages, derivations of all the equations, obviously everything we talked about here and more, 24, 23 or 24 references into the literature if you want to find out more about this. Um, and this brings me to my sales pitch. So everybody in this room knows a lot more about something than I do, which is not hard. But what's more, everybody in this room knows a lot more about something than half the other people in this room. And so I'd like to encourage you all to write a paper for the journal. This only works if everyone gets involved. Um, like Mike mentioned earlier, you don't need to write a full paper and then submit it, see if it gets in. You can write a paragraph, an abstract. I'd like to write about this, send it in. That's exactly what I did. They were very helpful. They said, yeah, absolutely, write it. And when I had questions along the way, they were right there um, with answers. I think everybody in this room has at least one paper in them, uh, and, and I'd like to read it. So. Please do that. Thanks for listening. That's my talk.